Hi, I'm James Harper. I am pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Douglasville, Georgia. And I appreciate you watching this video to learn more about who we are. This video is about women's ordination, a practice that is not super common in Christianity, but it's one that our denomination and others similar to us uh, do practice. And the reason for that is uh, we believe is biblical. Everything we do, every position we take, every practice we have, we believe is based on a faithful reading of Scripture. Now, there are those who do not think women should be ordained, and they do that based on a reading of Scripture. There are Bible texts used to prohibit women's ordination. Uh, I think there's some generic ones out there that um, can be used, but really the big one, the one that is the biggest obstacle to the ordination of women, and if this was the only thing we had to go on to decide if women should be ordained or not, then we wouldn't be ordaining women. It's from 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 12, and it says, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, rather she is to remain quiet. That's a pretty clear statement from Paul about women having authority over men. And if it were just that alone that we had to go on, then we would not ordain women. But I think there is more to the story than just that one text. What we notice in that passage is that uh, there are some couple of issues here. One is that the word that's translated authority is not a common Greek word. It's a very unusual Greek word to be used there. The word in this passage is authentane. That's translated to authority. But typically in the New Testament, authority comes is translated from a Greek word, exousia. So why would Paul use authentane rather than exousia, which he normally uses to talk about authority? In fact, we actually have to go into the secular world and the use of the Greek in the secular world at that time to get even an understanding of what exactly does authentain mean. And in those contexts, authentain is really used more to talk about a specific way of exercising authority, one that is heavy-handed and is generally given a negative connotation which would imply that there are specific issues <clears throat> that Paul is asking Timothy to address in, in, to, in the ways that women are behaving in that church, uh, and it's being dis, uh, disruptive. The other reason that we think there's something unusual going on here is that Paul goes on to say in that same chapter, just a couple of verses later, yet she will be saved through childbearing. If they continue in faith and love and, and holiness with self-control. Again, it's pretty unusual for Paul to say about a woman that she's going to be saved through childbearing. When Paul himself and Peter and every other, other person in the New Testament talks about salvation coming not from childbearing, but from coming from God through Jesus Christ. So why would Paul be talking about that? And if we're going to make a general statement about women's ordination, we might be inclined to treat the same verse two or three verses later to talk about women's, that while we talk about women's ordination with authority, we also ought to talk about salvation with the same kind of authority and say uh, there's a double standard of salvation. One is you believe in Jesus Christ, or if you're a woman, you're going to be saved through childbirth. That's kind of a, a ridiculous position to take. But if you're going to give the first verse that much authority, then the second verse should be given similar authority, I would at least conclude. And so what's going on? Well, there's a, it happens at times in the Bible that there are passages that seem inconsistent with the other, that the overall witness of Scripture. And so we use a practice to help navigate that called letting Scripture interpret Scripture. All that means is that there are some texts that are just, as an ancient document, written in a way that are difficult to translate, difficult to interpret, and figure out what's going on. A lot of times there are specifically contextually related issues that we have to back up and say, okay, let's, what is the whole witness of 
scriptures say or the whole witness of the New Testament say about issues so that we can use that to get a better understanding of what a specific text is about, particularly when that text has some very unusual parts to it, some things that make it seem like there's more to the story than we understand. And so when, we comes, when it comes to women's ordination, we do that. And one of the things we learn from Scripture is we let Scripture interpret the whole Scripture. One truth that is certainly prevalent in the New Testament, that it's a dominant understanding uh, of what Jesus accomplished in his life, death, and resurrection, is that Jesus reversed the curse of sin and its consequences. That is made very clear in the New Testament that the sin that occurred in Genesis has been reversed by Jesus, that the consequences of the sin has been reversed by Jesus, uh, and we have salvation because of that. Well, it's important to note that one of the consequences of sin is this um, women having uh, being submissive to men, men having authority over women. Before the, the fall, uh, there was a symbiotic relationship, a balanced relationship between Adam and Eve that they were helper and helpmate. But after the fall, Genesis 3.16 says, One of the curse of sin is that to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. I think we can assume that the curse of sin had not been reversed, then that's the way we would organize ourselves as we waited for salvation and for Jesus to come and reverse the curse. But Jesus has come. He lived, he died, he was raised to establish salvation for his people, and therefore there ought to be a difference in how we understanding life before the curse and life after the reverse of the curse. And uh, Jesus reversed that curse. That's what Paul's talking about in Galatians three thirteen to 14. He said, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So uh, the reversing of the curse, in, in a sense, gives a bigger testimony to what Jesus accomplished and is one reason why we think ministry is for women and men. And that position, I think, is found in other affirmations in the New Testament. For example, in Galatians, Paul goes on to say, For as many of you as were baptized in the Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Paul, who is, um, you know, the dominant voice of the New Testament, the dominant voice in how we understand the doctrine of the church, is saying that because Jesus reversed the curse, in him there is no distinction between male and female. All are one. We can also see that in the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, Joel 2, Joel 2, 28 and 29 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. What Joel is saying is that there is going to come a day where women and men, where male servants and female servants will be used by God to prophesy. And I would say prophesying and preaching are very close in practice. But then that, <clears throat> that prophecy was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 when Peter gets up in the birth of the church and says this is consistent with what has been prophesied. He said in the last days... It shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. It is significant that in the 
pouring out of the Holy Spirit that birthed the church as, uh, as we see it today, that that specific prophesy, Peter, what says, was fulfilled. Uh, that the Spirit has been poured out and that men and women and male servants and female servants will be able to prophesy and to declare the words of God, which is, in a sense, a position of authority. To be able to prophesy what God is saying is to be able to say you're speaking with some authority about what God says, and that's pretty darn close to preaching. In Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, Paul says, in describing the ministry of the church, he says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. If you notice, there's no distinction about men or women there. It is anybody is in that category, male or females in that category, then they're there to do the work of the church, the equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Those apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers, there's no distinction whether they're to be male or female. And then Peter says, as each, no male or female, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks, there's no distinction, male and female, again, as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then, again, 1 Corinthians 11 says, But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Now, if women were not allowed to pray or prophesy or lead in church to preach, if you will, then why would it matter if their head was uncovered or not? The fact that they are doing that and that they need to have their head covered, which is a completely different issue. We can talk about that another time. Then clearly they have a role of ministry in the church. And I'll, one, other, one other place where I think there's an affirmation that the curse has been reversed, that women have a new standing in this uh, post-resurrection life of the church and that is uh, that who are the first evangelists, the first ones to preach the story of Jesus' resurrection? Well, it was the women. You get from Luke 24, it says, And they remembered his words, Jesus' words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, who was it? It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. The first people to declare the news of the resurrection were women. In fact, in one version of the Gospels, the women go to tell the men, and the men say, oh, that's an idle tale. You don't know what you're talking about, that. You're, you're um, emotional. But then they found out that, indeed, it was true that Jesus was resurrected. So the first ones who brought the news of resurrection were the women, and it's fitting because it was the woman who gave, you know, it was woman Eve who gave Adam the, ap the apple, the fruit from which to eat that caused sin to enter the world. And it is the women who are first to be part of sharing the story of the reversing of the curse. It makes sense in the biblical picture. And that's the, that's the larger story of the New Testament. And that's the larger story helps us understand and frame is, is the statement about women at first Timothy 2 meant to be universal or is it meant to deal with a particular problem of women acting with an authority that was negative, a heavy handed kind of authority and I think the bigger witness of scripture would say that that 1 Timothy 2 is not intended to be a universal statement but a statement to deal with specific issues in that context now we can go on and see that there's a whole history of people who got women who God has used for his work <clears throat> before the birth of the church and afterwards. You have in Genesis Tamar, you have Miriam in Exodus, you have Rahab and Joshua, you have Deborah and the Judges, you have Rizpah in 2 Samuel, you have Huldah 
in 2 Kings. You have Esther in the book of Esther. You have the Marys in the gospel. You have Lydia, founder of a church in Acts 16. You have Priscilla, a chief worker in the church in Acts 18. You have the unmarried daughters that are listed in Acts 21. And then you have Phoebe, another leader in the church in Rome. So the big picture, the overwhelming message of the biblical narrative in the New Testament is that women have an important role in ministry of the church, leading the church. And I think those testimonies together make a very compelling picture of what it means that when Jesus died on the cross, he took the curse upon himself, reversed the curse that was given in Genesis 3. And because of that now, women and men together, as been testified to in several passages, women and men, both now are one and both have uh, a role to play and gifts to bring to ministry equally and that women and men can both be ordained in the ministry. I hope that helps you understand a little bit about why we do what we do. And as always, if you have questions, you can email me at james at fpcdouglasville.org. Thanks for watching.